Hi. Hi, hi, everyone. And the big thanks for taking the time, Elon. You know, we've been trying to get you on the podcast since we started it two years ago. So we are super pleased that we that we have you on and indeed on your X platform. How cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, we have like lots of people from all around the world simultaneously do effectively a real time podcast and uh, it works pretty well. Good. Well, we have so much to talk about. So love to kick off with with AI. Now, what's your take on where we are in the AI race just now? Wow, that's a long answer. There's, there's so much happening in it. AI is the fastest advancing technology I've ever seen of any kind. And I've seen a lot of technology. You know, barely a week goes by without some new announcement. So, and, and if you look at the amount of AI hardware, the computers coming online that are dedicated to AI, that is increasing what looks like at least by a factor of 10 every year, if not every six to nine months. So when you combine the hardware coming online, really an order of magnitude increase every, you know, call it at least every nine months, and many, many software breakthroughs. If, if you look at that, that curve, it looks insane. So I think we'll, my, my, my guess is that we'll, so we'll have AI that is smaller than any, any one human, probably to, around the end of next year. And then AI, the total amount of sort of sentient compute of AI, I think will probably exceed all humans in five years. What, what is that race about just now? Is it algorithms? Is it people? Is it computing power? What, it, what is it about just now? Is it the supply of chips? What is it? Yeah, last, last year it was chip constrained. And the hardware deployment, for, to break it down into the, the three areas of people, data and hardware, uh, starting with hardware. Last year it was about a chip supply. People could not get enough NVIDIA chips particularly. This year, it's starting to transition to a voltage transformer supply. So just actually getting up voltage transformers put in place. So my sort of very niche joke is transformers for transformers, because a lot of the AI that's run is called a transformer. You need transformers to run transformers. And then next, in the if you look out a year or two, or certainly three years, it's just electricity availability. So that's the, those are the constraints on the hardware side. So many of the smart, world's smartest people are, are doing AI. People that would have done physics before, in fact, or had have done physics, for example, have moved into AI uh, because it's just the fastest moving field. So we're seeing a lot of the best talents, a lot of the smartest humans going into AI. And then uh, we see, along with that, algorithmic breakthroughs. And then, then you start hitting the, the wall with the, the, the data problem. So the, you, you can fit all books ever written, just the text, the, the text in compressed form on one hard drive, or we'll call it one, one computer. So when, you, when you're looking at like tokens to train on, yeah. and, and you, because you can still think of like all the books ever written in, every, in, in all languages by all humans, sounds like a lot. Certainly it's far more than any one human could, could ever read. It actually is a small, no, it's, it's, it's a small number of tra- training tokens. It's just not enough. So then you, you start having to look at all the videos ever created, you know, all the podcasts, all the everything. And and you start even running out of data there. Well, hopefully they, hopefully they will include this podcast. Definitely will include this podcast. What's the biggest challenge you have with, with XAI? Well, XAI is, is still relatively new. So it's not, you know, like the limiting factor right now is just training our Grok version 2 model, which should be, we think, better than GPT-4. And that's we're hoping to complete that in May. So that's that's training right now. So it's just really, we're, we're just trying to get enough GPUs online to train it fast enough to get that done in May, which I think it'll, probably will happen. And then, and, that, and that's with roughly 20,000 H100s. And, and during, I think, very efficient training, then the next step would be for Grok 3, which would be, I guess, GPT-5 or beyond, would, you know, requires uh, 100,000 NVIDIA H100s training coherently. So that's, you know, a half order of magnitude, basically, more training. And then you really start to have running into this data problem where you, you have to either create synthetic data or use real-world video. Those are the, the, the two sources of kind of like unlimited data, synthetic data and real-world video, which I should say Tesla has a pretty big advantage in real-world video. Tesla has by far the most real-world video of anyone. Yeah, you've got a huge library there. So when do you think, so when do you think we'll see proper AGI? Well, it depends on how you define AGI. If you define AGI as smarter than the smartest human, I think it's probably end of next year, like like within two years. But but that's that. There's still there's still a pretty big leap beyond that to say smarter than the the machine augmented human collective. So like, is it smarter than all humans working t- together who are also using computers to augment their output? 
And that, that I think is probably five years away. One, one way to look at it is, is, is to try to assess like roughly what is the ratio of digital to biological compute? And the, so biological compute are all the human brains that are thinking. Last question on, on AI, any new thoughts on regulation and how it should be structured? Well, I, I think we probably do need some sort of regulatory authority to look at the safety of AI, just as we have regulatory authorities in other arenas to you know, oversee aircraft and the safety of aircraft and cars and, and other things, you know, medication. So the rate at which AI is progressing is, fast, is faster than probably any regulatory agency can keep up with. But I, I do have a comment on what I think is very important for uh, achieving safe AI, which is that uh, it's very important to train the AI to be as truthful as possible and not to, yeah, yeah just to be as truthful as possible. It, it, the, 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 I think you can get some very dangerous things when you program an AI to be politically correct. Things that, things that may seem uh, relatively innocuous now but will not be so in, in the future if AI has immense power. You can take the Google Gemini example where it refused to publish, to produce a picture of George Washington as a white man. And, and any, in fact, any historical figure would automatically be made diverse because it's been programmed to insist on diversity, which sounds, you know, perhaps okay at first, but not if the AI has so much power that it can actually enforce diversity and decide there's too many of one kind of people or too many of one sex and kill off the uh, kids just just kill off enough until the, the diversity number is is what is programmed to believe is correct but do you think this will be sorted out in the next version no you don't think so where is china where is china now <laughs> relative to the sorted us out the next version no they'll make it more subtle okay and less obvious but it will still be there okay well we'll see but where, where is china where do you where is china now in relative to the U.S.? I, I don't know exactly where China is, except that there are a lot of very smart people in China, and they, they, won't, be, they won't be far behind the rest of the world, far behind the, the U.S. I mean, the AI right, AI right now is very concentrated in San Francisco and London, and then, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot happening in, in China, but I, I've, I'm, I don't have insight into what they're doing, except that they, I'm confident they will not be far behind what is developed in the West. Yeah. So... But, but, but mark my words, the, if, if, if we do not program an AI and be as truthful as possible, that, that is where it, it will go by. That is where the danger lies. Moving tack here, moving to, to Tesla. Is, is the EV conversion now going slower than you had expected? Just where is the speed of conversion now relative to your expectations? I think it's going quite fast, actually, especially in Norway. Um, Absolutely. Well, it's pretty much all there is, is your Teslas. Yeah, there's a lot of Teslas in Norway. It's crazy. Thanks. I once again like to thank Norway for the support of electric vehicles. So much appreciated. Oh, no, no um, time. <clears throat> so, I, I think it's we will the, the, that that electric that all vehicles will go fully electric. It's only a matter of time. That includes aircraft ultimately and boats, obviously trains. The only thing that is ironically difficult to where well, you can't really make it electric is rockets because you need you can't get away from having to expel mass, sort of Newton's third law. But, but all, all cars will be electric, it's only a matter of time. And we'll look back on combustion cars in the same way that we look at, back on steam engines, that, that it, was, it was inevitable that there would be internal combustion cars, and it's just as inevitable that all cars will go electric. And right. there will be some ebb and flow, you know, it's not like it's going to be a completely straight up line. There will be some ebb and flow in how, like, how far electric cars go, but, that, but the ultimate Victory of electric cars is inevitable. And I think the sooner we get there, the better. Yeah. How do you see the Chinese competition here now? We generally find that the companies in China are the most competitive in the world. And certainly in electric vehicles or cars in general, the Chinese car companies are by far the most competitive. Yeah. That's where, where we find the most tough, the toughest competitive, competitive challenges that they make great cars and they work very hard. So when you ride in one of the Chinese cars, what do you think? I mean, you're an engineer, you know all about it. What do you, what do you think? I haven't ridden in, I have not ridden in one lately, but because they're not all available here, you know, in the U.S. or very, very few are available in the U.S. Some are available in Europe, but from what my team tells me, they are very good. Now you are moving into India here as well in terms of production. What are your What are your thoughts here? So moving into where? To India. Oh, India. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's you know, in, India is sort of a. It's, it's, India is now the most populous country in the world. You know, the biggest population, and I think there's we, we, India just should have electric cars, just like every other country has electric cars. And yeah, so it's a natural progression to 
provide electric Tesla electric vehicles in India. Yeah. Uh, moving moving out out in space, what what would it take to be self sufficient at Mars? To be self sufficient on Mars, it's really about the, the total tonnage that is delivered to the surface of Mars. So you can say like, well, um, I, I think it's probably on the order of a million tons, maybe maybe more, but somewhere between probably a million tons and ten million tons are needed to make Mars self sufficient. And how many rockets is that? Well, I gave a presentation on this recently. If people look at my my recent SpaceX talk, but if you if you have a hundred, it really if you have 100 tons per flight, you need 10,000 flights to get to a million, million tons. And that's 100 tons landed to the surface of Mars. So in order to get uh, 100 tons landed to the surface of Mars, you need five, ton- five times that number in Earth orbit. So we do a lot of orbital refilling. So launching sort of rocket t- tanker ships over and over again that, that would replenish the propellant of the ships that would go to Mars. And then you'd need a, roughly an order of 10,000 of them to get to a million tons. And but we we plan to do that. That we're that's that's what we th- we think we can get that done within twenty years. Really? So wh- and when do you think? So when do you think we'll be there for the first time? First, well, the first Starship that will land on Mars, which obviously will not have people at first, I think is probably within about five years. And then it would probably launch several ships and just confirm that they can land okay on Mars. We'll also be doing the Moon simultaneously with that. So got taking. Well, I think we'll, I think we'll get people back to the moon. I should say within five years, and we'll get uncrewed ships landed on Mars within five years. And and then we'll be building up the production rate and improving the design of the booster of the ship. So so in the first people on Mars, I think within seven years or so, seven to nine years. And from from there, we need to rapidly increase. We need massive numbers of ships going. And Earth and Mars only in the same quadrant of the solar system roughly for six months every two years. Or, or at least it's only possible to really transfer efficiently from Earth to Mars, I say every six months, but really there's about there's a couple months where it's, where it's ideal every 26 months. So every two years that you would see a, basically a fleet depart Mars. And I think it would be quite a spectacular thing to see a thousand ships depart from Mars all at once, like Battlestar Galactica. What kind of new technology do we need before we'll be self-sufficient there? Actually, I think we have all the tech. We already know all the technology that's necessary for that. It just needs. To, we just need to build. No new physics is needed for this. Why is it so important for you? I think it's important for consciousness in general. So, if if we wish to maximize the lifespan of consciousness, then being a multi-planet species will result in a much longer existence of consciousness consciousness than if we are on one planet. If we're on one planet, we're simply biding our time until there's eventually a calamity. It could be soon. It could be a long time. But eventually, something will happen. It could be a global thermonuclear war. It could be simply that civilization merely subsides. Our civilization may not die with a bang, it may die with a whimper, just just gradually falling into obsolescence. But if we're a multi-planet species, then we've got two planets, and the, and they can support each other. And we can go beyond two planets, ultimately, to the moons of Jupiter, to the to the you know, beyond to the the outer parts of the solar system and ultimately to other star systems so this tiny this tiny candle of consciousness that we have in this vast darkness can be extended and amplified and we're just far more likely to survive as for, for consciousness to survive if we are a multi-planet species you don't think it'd be better to use all these resources and try to sort out earth well, just to put this in perspective, the amount of resources I'm talking about for making life multiplanetary would be less than 1% of all resources on Earth. So I really can think of it as resource allocation. Do you think it's worth spending half a percent of Earth resources to ensure that we have redundancy in consciousness and that we extend consciousness beyond Mars to other planets, to, to, to Mars and other planets and ultimately other star systems? And then also take into account the fact that there are certain inevitable, there's certain things we simply cannot avoid on Earth. Like, is it within your power or mine to stop World War Three? I don't think so, no. if it happens. And if we have global thermonuclear warfare, our technology level will drop to the Stone Age, and we may never survive. And then there are, we maybe get hit like by a, uh, a comet, like the dinosaurs. And you know, if the dinosaurs had spaceships, they, they'd probably still be around. So and then if you, if you wait long enough, the Earth, the, the sun will continue to expand and eventually engulf Earth and destroy it, and destroy all life. So just to give it an amount, a certain amount of time, no matter what you do on Earth, no matter how careful you are, Earth will life, all life on Earth will die. But that it will happen is a certainty. It's a bit gloomy, this, no? So on a slightly less gloomy note, X, Twitter. Yeah. What is your vision now? What do you, how do you see the 
the vision of X. Our goal of X is to be the best source of truth on the internet. And I think we're breaking a good, you know, good progress there. And it, I mean, this, it's going to be like the, I call it everything app. Like any, if you, anything you want to do, you can do on the X platform, whether it's text, audio, video, payments, financial stuff, communications of all kinds. And then, but then also where, where there is publicly disseminated information just to be the best source of truth. And I think it, I think it already is that. Now people may say, oh, there's some piece of misinformation, disinformation. I say, yes, but look, look at the replies. The replies correct that misinformation. And look at community notes and, the, and how good the batting average of community notes is. It's extremely good. It's by far the best fact-checking system on the internet. So, and, and, and a lot of people still labor under the illusion that the, the, the legacy newspapers that they read are actually true. There's so much nonsense in them. I mean, Nico, how many times do, when, do you read a, an article in a newspaper where you know the circumstances of what that article is and how often is it spot on? No, of course it's normally it's, no, no. Of course we, we all know it's normally wrong. But but how do you look? At, not sure. But how, how do you look at the situation now? For instance, with with Russia, you know, the work Russia does in Germany with fake accounts and so on is pretty pretty huge activity, right? I mean, we don't see a lot of Russian activity, to be frank, on the system. So we we see very little. We we, we do see we do see a lot of lot of attempts to influence things, but they seem to be coming from from the West, not from from Russia. Right. What about what about things like the latest developments in in Brazil and oh, so on? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the we were, we kept getting these demands from this judge Alexander. That's his that's his name on Twitter at Alexander. And there would be to suspend accounts immediately. We were given typically two hours to suspend an account or face massive fines. And the the final straw is we were we were being given demands to suspend setting setting members of the parliament and major journalists. And moreover, we could not tell them that it, this was at the behest of Alexander Morales. We had to pretend that it was due to our rules of service. And that was the final straw, and we said no. Now, when you when you bought Twitter, now renamed X, did you expect that you would end up in these type of situations? So is this all unexpected? Well, I knew it wouldn't be just a total bed of roses, you know. And it, it's talking, I wouldn't, it's, no, I mean, I, I thought it would be, so it's like, look, we're, we're, we're just like, Rigorously trying to pursue the, the 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 goal of being the most accurate and truthful place in the internet, and that that doesn't mean that what is said is always true or accurate. But it's, it is perhaps another way to frame it is as the least inaccurate place on the internet. Do you do yeah. you secretly do you secretly think this is a bit fun? It's fun. At, yeah, yeah, it's fun at times. It's stressful at times, and it's fun at times. But in, in overall, we're trying to serve the people of Earth, and and and, and this is sort of an esoteric, sort of maybe an esoteric way of viewing it, but to try to be kind of like the, the group consciousness of Earth. So you can think of like if each person is like a neuron contributing to like the collective brain of Earth and you want to try to minimize the noise and maximize the signal of every neuron that's connected to the, the X network. That, that basically what, what, is, what is the collective will of, of humanity and, and, how to, and, and, and how to, yeah, just serve the collective will of humanity and so serve the greater good. That, that's our goal. Now, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be people who want to manipulate that information, and so we have to fight that and try to have, you know, be, be the most accurate place as, part, as to the best of our ability, and have it be kind of a marketplace of ideas where people can propose ideas and, you know, debate them. And I think so far it's working reasonably well in that regard. Now, people that don't like the truth will not like this X, or if they want to manipulate things, they will not like it. But only about a few years ago, you were you were a guy using electric vehicles. Now you are, you know, through Starlink, you've had some, you know, I mean, some big impact in in Ukraine with Twitter. You are kind of into some issues in, you know, Brazil, India, Turkey. You know, you're becoming like a real geopolitical force and a really important one. How do you? How do you look at that? Well, like I said, I'm really just, I'm trying to take the set of actions that maximize the probability that the future is good. I mean, we have to keep civilization going onward and upward as much as possible and, and try to minimize the civilizational threats that occur. Like, you know, we, we, we can't get to Mars if civilization collapses. It's not going to happen. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to keep, keep civilization going. And I think we should view our civilization as being much more fragile than we Thing. We, we kind of take for granted, oh, it's always going to be there. But actually, if you study history, you realize that there arise, you know, there's a rise and fall to civilizations. I mean, I was, I was reading in depth about the ancient Sumerians, who were, were arguably the first 
civilization, if you call civilization like writing and stuff, you know, they were the first to develop writing. And, uh, but eventually they died out and they were gone. So, and then nobody could read the writing at all. And, and they, they were just faded out as a civilization. But they're pretty impressive in their time. And the ancient Egyptians, the same thing. And uh, you know, one sort of one after another, ancient Greek had its, Greece had its day. You know, China and India had it will have incredibly impressive populations. But there's been ebbs and flows in the China, China and Indian civilizations over the the, the aeons, you know, the millennia as well. So you know, I, I guess I'm just trying to take this, this set of this, the steps that increase the scope and scale of consciousness. That's mm. that's what I'm trying to do. It's not like, it's not that I'm trying to have a political thumb on the scale or anything like that. But I, I think I'm trying to have the political will go where the people want it to go. Yeah. And, you, know. you, you mentioned some, some really smart people here and kind of just moving tack a bit here to corporate culture. Now, you manage a lot of geniuses in your, in your companies. What is the key to manage really smart people, you think? I don't, I don't think I manage smart people. They manage themselves. I, I think, you, well, I guess with really smart people, you don't, I don't really think of, of it like managing them. I think that if somebody is very smart and talented, they, they can go anywhere and do anything anytime. Like if they, they, they don't have to work with me, they could go anywhere. So I, I really just say like, look, this is the, the goal we're after and this is what we're trying to achieve. And do you agree with this goal? And if you do, then let's try to get it done and you know, provide my opinion along the way. And, but I, I, it's very rare for me to actually sort of insist on, an, on, on, on a particular thing. Once in a while, I'll say, look, guys, you just got to trust me on, on this one. We, we got to do this thing. And if it turns out to be a bad decision, you, we, can, we can all hold that against me in the future. But you have an incredible eye for detail, right? I mean, when we read the Isaac's book, it's pretty clear that you, I mean, you really are, are deep into detail and know what you talk about. So how do you, how do you balance yeah. this kind of micromanagement of some areas and then delegate other areas? <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it micromanagement. It's just insisting on attention to detail. That if you're, if you're trying to make a perfect product, you must have attention to de- attention attention to details essential. And I haven't actually read the Isaacson book. You should. It's very good, actually. I loved it. <laughs> well, I, I, I asked Walter Isaacson if I should read it, and he said I shouldn't. So, so then, <laughs> well, so okay, so then, it, then he said I shouldn't read it. So. Okay, well, I'll I'll ask you some questions from the book. Then they, you talk, he talks about you know you the kind of the hardcore and ultra hardcore culture. What is an ultra hardcore culture? I guess it's work. I mean, it's working culture, right? I mean, yeah. how, how, I mean, ultra hard work, how hard is that? Well, when things get really intense, you're basically just working every waking hour. Um, and how, and how long can you do that for? I've done that for, well, continuously for sometimes like a few years. What does um, it do? What does it do to you? It really, it's pain. And, and every waking hour, maybe it's an exaggeration because there are a few hours, obviously with friends and family and critical other things. But 100-hour weeks would be, I've done many, many stretches of 100-hour weeks, like true 100-hour weeks, where roughly six hours per day is sleeping. I would not recommend that. This is not, that, that's for emergencies, you know. It's not uh, all the time. During di- very difficult times at Tesla, I've had to do that. And at, sometimes at the beginning of my earlier startups, I did that, where I just wouldn't leave the office. I would just sleep under my desk and just work seven days a week. Sometimes it's necessary for success or, or to avoid failure. But, but do, you, you, do you enjoy being in this crisis mode? No. I don't. It sucks. Okay. No, I, I don't want to be there. <laughs> it's pain. But sometimes it's the difference between success and failure. When you make decisions, how important is speed? He just gave me an idea, which is I'm going to invite the judge, Alexander, to do a spaces. And then he can explain why what I'm doing is bad and, and, may, and maybe he's right. I challenge, I challenge him to a spaces. Sounds good. Yeah. But what about speed? When you make, deci- when you, when you make decisions, how, how important is speed? And how do you how do you balance analysis with your gut feel? I think the the the, the best offense and defense is speed. If you think of something like the SR seventy one Blackbird, it really had almost no defenses except accelerate, and it was never shot down even once. Like I think over three thousand missiles were shot at the SR seventy one Blackbird, and none hit. And and really, what it did was just go faster. So the the power of speed is uh, underappreciated as a competitive dimension. Is that why? You know, SpaceX, for instance, has been so successful because you've been mean and lean as an organization and fast. I think speed, speed is uh, definitely a factor. Now, I should say, you want to go, in the, in the case of a company, you, you, you need to be a vector, not a scaler. So it can't be, you need to go at high speed in the right direction. Sure. So it can't just, so, and, and no company is going to be going in the right direction all the time. So you have to do course corrections, like a guided missile, you call it course corrections. And, uh, but in, in the case of SpaceX, it's like, okay, our goal is to extend humanity 
beyond Earth. And we didn't even know how to add, even frame the question correctly. Like, what, what, we just knew that that was the general goal. We didn't know what propellant we'd use or what the raw materials would be or for the, or how would the rocket be built, how would it be designed, what's actually important. And, you know, so, so for example, going f- from our Falcon architecture, which is uses refined jet fuel and liquid oxygen in an open cycle gas generator architecture engine to a to Starship, which is a liquid methane, liquid, liquid oxygen propellant, a staged combustion, very high pressure engine. The, that, that, that's, a, that's a big architectural change. But we didn't know that we, we needed to make that architectural change until we were pretty far down the road, like about halfway, it took us about 10 years to figure out that was even the right architecture. Now, I think SpaceX is one of the best examples I know about what we call failing well, right? Learning from mistakes and moving on. What, generally, how do, you, how do you look at mistakes? I mean, what, which, which ones do you tolerate and which ones don't you tolerate? Well, I, I think I don't really think of it that way. You know, the first three flights of SpaceX failed. The fourth one succeeded. And if, if the fourth one had not succeeded, we would have gone bankrupt. We would have had no money left. So it was a very close call. But since then, SpaceX has done very well. It's now the, the Falcon 9, you know, knock on wood, is the most reliable rocket in the world and launches about every two to three days. Now, last question on risk. What are the types of risks you would not want to take? Well, I, I think in, in terms of risks, you don't, you don't, you don't want to take risks that... Where if, if You only want to take bet the company risks if they're absolutely necessary. So there have been a few times where, say, in the t- with Tesla, we, we just had no choice but to bet the company. Because if we're, if, we're incre- if we're doing a new vehicle program that is an order of magnitude larger than the, the past one, then we're just unequivocally betting the company because the new vehicle will be... 90% of production. So going from the original Roadster to the Model S, original Roadster was only, you know, about 600, 6, 700 per year. Then Model S was 20,000 per year. And, and then Model 3 is sort of half, is sort of half a million per year. Model Y, over a million per year. So th- these are all bet the company vehicles. But the, the, the reason we could do, for example, the Cybertruck, which was kind of a, a radical new design, was because it wasn't a bet the company decision. So I was like, okay, look, let's try something. I want to try something totally crazy. It's like, what what truck would Blade Runner drive? Is that the you one know? you're going to drive? On? Yeah, I think it would be perfect for Mars. But like, we could try something that, where there's some chance that people might not like it, but it's it's radical and new, and it's aesthetically, aesthetically, it's not derivative. It doesn't look like anything else on the road, whereas all the other sort of pickup trucks look like vague copies of one another. They we could afford to take a chance and, on failure and say like, and talk it up to, you know, well, we tried, you know, we tried to do something interesting. But but actually, by the way, the Cybertruck is doing great. So, but one of the things that I think is important for innovation is that you do accept failure. Like, like necessarily, you have to always look at the incentive structure of an organization and say, you know, is that, is that organization properly incenting innovation? And in, with the, if you do innovation, you're necessarily going to uncharted territory. So there are going to be some mistakes. There are going to be some failures. And you have, you have to, like, like actually, like for, for SpaceX uh, rocket engine development, like I keep telling the team, look, if we're not occasionally blowing up an engine on the test stand, we're not trying hard enough, you know? How important so, are the P- how important is research and PhDs and that kind of stuff? I think I've said seen somewhere you you think most PhDs are useless. Well, I think most PhD theses are useless, <laughs> which I think is actually objectively true. If you look at how many PhD or look at all how many PhDs are created every year and how many of those papers are actually used in anything, then objectively most PhD theses are have very low utility uh, or maybe zero because nobody uses them. Or, so once in a while you get something that is spectacular, but it's pretty rare. Perhaps something more useful and in the book that you haven't read talks about your love for gaming, in particular like strategic ability gaming. And I've been thinking quite a lot about it. What, what have you learned from, from those games? And have that learning and wisdom been helpful when you have been planning your companies? Yeah, I, it's hard to say exactly what I've learned from video games, except that I, I do like playing video games as... If I want to take my mind off work, I'll typically play a very hard video game. Such as which one? Well, over the years, there's been many, many different video games. So, you know, when I was a little kid, it was like, you know, Pong and the little tank games and things. And if you take a game like, for example, Civilization, it's actually quite a good, it tells you how, how civilizations are formed. Like I remember, I remember playing the original Civilization with the technology tree and, and how you'd invent different things. You'd like invent literacy and invent democracy and invent gunpowder. Gun all, all these things that like, and you start to realize, oh wow, there the, are the stages to technology. Like you can't, you know, you, you can't actually get to democracy without literacy. 
And, uh, you know, so there's these, there's these stages of, of technology development or stages of ideas that, you know, that's, uh, that's a helpful framework for a company. And I guess in, in, in like, or like I say, in, in recent years, there was, a, there was a game I played that was actually developed in Sweden called Polytopia, which is actually quite a good game. People like playing chess, but I think chess is not a, not a great... There's not a lot of transfer learning from chess to the real world because in chess, you've got only 64 squares. Uh, it's a set-piece battle, same pieces every time. There, there are no terrain differences. There's no technology tree. Uh, there's no fog of war. But say a game like Polytopia has all of those things, uh, random terrain generation, you know, d- differences in attack and defense bonuses, depending on what type of terrain. You've got 16 tribes, I think, each with different abilities. So you've got a technology tree that you can choose to develop in different ways. And, and you've got, of course, Fog of War. So that, I think, is much more, much closer to reality. So I think for Polytopia, I mean, I, I, was, I was playing Diablo for a while, which is pretty fun. The Diablo at, at high levels gets very complicated. They, you could call it like a, a spreadsheet with a game attached. So, so that, that's, and I, I briefly got the, the, for about a day, the world record in this abattoir of Zir on a, on a four person team of, of clearing the, the hardest level, which was, you know, not bad for someone who's like 53. <laughs> Basically, it will be 50 soon. There is still some Twitch element to it. And it's hard to beat kids at games with a Twitch element. But yeah, I like, I find these games interesting. If, if you can be fully immersed in a game, it's great. Now, what is the score now of, in terms of the union in Sweden and the collective bargaining? Actually, I, I think I think the storm has passed on that front. I think things are in reasonably good shape in Sweden. So yeah, so I think things are good. Overall, yeah, I feel pretty good about the future. I mean, you know, there's going to be bumpy quarters from you know here and there. But I think the long-term future of Tesla is extremely strong. For example, just the last question here: What do you want your legacy to be? I, I don't. I don't mind if my legacy is uh, accurate or, or inaccurate, provided that I I die feeling that I've done the right thing for the future of consciousness. So just trying to trying to have this, this light of consciousness last as long as possible, and maybe understand more about the nature of the universe or simulation or whatever this is. I have a philosophy of curiosity, which is to understand the universe, understand the nature of the universe or even what questions to ask. I would, I would say so I would subscribe to the Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy School of Philosophy that we're trying to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. Okay, I think that's a good place to end. For sure, the life and life on, on this planet would have been a lot more boring without you. And so, well, I'm glad to spice it up a little. Totally. <laughs> All right, well, it's good talking.